Here we go, y'all. Hey, Sherry. I see you, baby. my children of the sun welcome to the open eye on whge 95.3 fm the education station i'm your host patrice gibbs excuse me for being a little late dealing with the, this technology sometimes that's how live radio goes you deal with it and make it happen that's right and hey your third eye optometrist is going to make it happen yes i am facebook live tune in on facebook if you got the technology, baby. Yes, indeed. Our illustrious leader in these trying times assured me that he had disinfected the station. So I, I feel safe here right now. You never know. Hey, stay safe out there, y'all. This thing ain't no joke. This thing, you know what? Let me tell you something. And I want to credit whoever came up with this on my Facebook page. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly, Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress. And Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons. And not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you're fighting for. The world continues its life and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message. The world is saying, you are not necessary. The air, earth, water and sky without you are fine when you come back remember that you are my guest 
not my masters. The open eye. I'm Patrice Gibbs. As I always tell you, you do not have to wait until Saturday morning at 11 to tune in to WHGE 95.3, the FM, FM, the education station. We have a full week of programming for you. Tune in. If there's nobody on the air, there's some swinging music always happening at WHGE 95.3 FM. You know, there was recently an article in the St. Petersburg, uh, Florida Times. The business sex section asked readers for ideals on how to fix the economy. I think this 80-year-old guy nailed it. Dear Mr. President, please find below my suggestion for fixing America's economy. Instead of giving billions of dollars to companies that will squander the money on lavish parties and unearned bonuses, use the following plan. You can call it the patriotic retirement plan. Now, there are about 40 million people over 50 in the workforce. Pay them a million dollars a piece. A million dollars severance for early retirement with the following stipulations. One, they must retire. Boom. 40 million job openings. Unemployment fixed. Two, they must buy a new American-made car. 40 million cars order. Auto industry fixed. They must either buy a house or pay off their mortgage. Housing crisis fixed. It can't get any easier than that. P.S. If more money is needed, have all members of Congress pay their damn taxes. Mr. President, while you're at it, make Congress retire on Social Security and Medicare. I bet you both programs would be fixed pronto. If you think this will work, tell everybody about it. Tell your congressman and your senator and the next president yeah this is the open eye i'm patrice gibbs look uh i know what's going on and i know y'all want to get to some information on you know our current situation i'm gonna get there don't you worry about that i'm definitely gonna get there but as i always do i have to bring our history into some relevance so that you understand. You don't know where you come from. You don't know where you are. Okay. I'm sure many of you have never heard of Orwellian propaganda. Now, what is that? Let me break that down for you. Okay. After Thomas Edison patterned his light bulb, no companies purchased it nor mass produced it because it didn't work. It didn't work well. It lit very dimly, overheated, and often lasted only a few minutes. It was officially declared as not efficient enough for mass production. The inventor whose light bulb was purchased and mass produced by companies and his inventor dispatched around and his invention dispatched around the world by governments to oversee the uh, the installation was an African American inventor. He he invented the filament that allowed Edison's light bulb to burn. His name was Lewis Latimer. So the true and factual narrative is that it was a black man that really lit up the entire world. Latimer is also the inventor that wrote up the blueprint for Graham Bell's telephone. Latimer wasn't a joke. Now this brings me around to Orwellian propaganda. White society is literally falsely scripted to perpetrate the myth of white racial superiority. And white historians and propagandists distort all facts to meet this agenda. The practice is known as Orwellian propaganda. And it's the reason why your perception of reality is an elaborate white deception. Now, some people say, oh, well, that, that's just racist to say, well, you know what? It's interesting when, you know, you tell the truth, people come up with all kind of false criticisms to offset that truth. It's something, you know, 
Nobody loves a warrior until the enemy is at the gate, huh? I'm Patrice Gibbs. Yeah. All right, Brother Vaughn, I see you in there. As her. I see some other people around here too. What is this? Wait a minute. Oh yeah, the Carol. What's up? What's up, D? Percy. Yeah, I know I sound like my boy, you know. Give me shout outs. <laughs> it's all good. What the propaganda tells us, what the propaganda tells us about Africa. You know, you watch uh, TV and see these commercials where, you know, you see all these um, starving African children and, you know, there's, there's still this thought even in amongst African Americans that you know, Africa is some sort of wilderness or, mm, you know, other people are living in huts and what have you, you know, and it's, it's a misconception. It's just not so. The reality is there are, throughout the African continent, thriving metropolis cities, cities with suburbs, where people are living quite well, you know, and in spite of the colonizers from Europe, America, and China now, you know, there is some um, real good news from Africa. I got this report here. Several African countries expected to be among the fastest growing economies, at least until 2027, when they'll peak. Africa is emerging as a new power, as its social, economic, and political improvements show a consistent pace that will position them to play an important role in global affairs. Africa has come, Africa has come a long way in terms of economic growth in the past few years. According to The Economist, several of the continent's countries are on track to have fast growing economies. Africa is changing so rapidly, it's becoming hard to ignore. Rapid uh, economic and social change will give the continent a bigger role in world affairs. In 2019, Kenya reclaimed its crown for having the largest economy in Eastern and Central Africa, beating out its developing neighbor, Ethiopia, for the first time since 2016. The continent's demographics play a huge role in its growth. According to The Economist, Africa's population will nearly double by 2050, totaling to more than a quarter of the world's population. Additionally, PwC reported that countries like Nigeria have the potential to overpower France and Germany in size if the GDP matches the population growth. Now, to tell you something about this population growth, it's amongst young people. Okay, of course, in places like uh, Europe and here in America, amongst the Caucasians, they're having a zero population growth. Even some uh, places in Europe are having a negative population growth. Now, as they, as the African countries advance as far as their population, they're also advancing their technology. And many of these countries are wising up that they do not need the colonizers from Europe, America, and China to advance their technology and their infrastructure. They are learning what they have once forgotten, or what was beaten out of them is that they do have the ability to manage a state. 
okay? Efforts to reach this goal, finish this off here, will be helped by improving education systems and lowering trade barriers if achieved with strong execution. That's another thing. Much of this progress is also dependent on whether governments become more accountable. Case in point, we have an example of that. Nigeria decided that they were going to bring in Chinese doctors uh, to help with the uh, coronavirus. The Nigerian doctor said, oh, no, we got this. We got this. They stood their government down on that. And they let them know, no, 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 no. We are not having it. We are not having it. Yeah. Holding your government accountable. That's what you got to do, brothers over there now, my brothers. Africa still faces its challenges to the path of improving the continent's way of life, COVID-19, in the short term, could threaten the overall health and wellness of citizens. Of course, you know, uh, Africa has the lowest numbers right now of uh, the COVID-19, the coronavirus. While climate change could also make reaching the optimistic goals difficult. You know, like I said, as long as you hold your government accountable, those that have become educated as far as dealing with climate change and what have you, the, the, the advancement will continue. I think one of the strongest leaders is Robert uh, Kagame of Rwanda. Okay, this brother is showing you how it's done. And he's a Pan-Africanist, he's for the unification of Africa and Africans all over the world. So I'm feeling this brother, I'm telling you. Uh, pay attention, God. This is an open eye. <laughs> Um, Patrice Gibbs. If the coronavirus hasn't shown us anything, what it has shown us is that the orange disaster is just that, a disaster. Those of you that, and I, I'm sure no one out there listening right now falls in the category, those that voted for Donald Trump, you know, I hear them all, often say, well, I voted for him because, you know, he's a, a, he, he's, he's a, he's a, a brilliant, genius businessman. And, and, you know, he's one of the best businessmen in America. And he's made it happen as far as a businessman. And blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. Get out of here with that. Let me tell you something. And he's, oh, he, he'll tell you that himself. Because, you know, his ego is, is way off the hook. Uh, no adjustment there. His ego is way off the hook. And according to him, he's the best businessman. He said this, I quote, the orange disaster. I'm the best businessman in the world because I know how to negotiate. He's a crook. Let me tell you how good a businessman he is. Those of you that know anything about his story, his incompetence, know the orange disaster. Started out with $2 million from his father, which he immediately blew. Okay. Father gave him some more money. 
He bought the Trump Plaza Hotel for $400 million. It was repossessed by the bank. You know, I shot a businessman he is now. Mm -hmm. Bought his yacht for $29 million. Repossessed by the bank. Yeah. The repo man don't like you doing it into the orange disaster. Built four casinos at a cost of $3 billion. Five were bankruptcy and went out of business. Stiff contractors and employees and employees. Now, anybody running a casino, a casino is a cash cow. You running a casino, the mob ran casinos in Vegas and in the Caribbean and Europe for decades and skim money off the top. You know, just was just skimming money off the top like nothing in these. Casinos just kept right on churning in the money. It was like a money machine, a money trick. Started Trump Airlines, the orange disaster here. Never made a profit. Planes and helicopters repossessed by a city bank. Trump Mortgage, Trump Baca, and Trump States all went out of business. This is the brilliant businessman that you thought was going to run the uh run america like a business and be this big success well he's running it like he ran his businesses running it into the ground so i call him the orange disaster because anything he touches turns out to be a disaster the thing is bankrupt america can't be repossessed by the bank or can it? we have to figure that out i don't know what they're going to repossess they already own it pretty much why these banksters get away with all the crap they get away with. Okay. Now, I'll tell you what else is going on with the um, COVID-19. You know, in efforts to stay safe, states and the government is encouraging people to practice social distance. When you're outside, stay six feet away from people. When you go to the store, most stores have blocks uh, taped off that are six feet apart and just supposed to not violate that. Okay. And of course, some people will, you know. And some of the on state practices I've seen out here too many people congregating in front of the liquor store. You know, I see some people that, you know, have been dealing with hard times long before this. Going up and down the street, looking on the ground for cigarette butts. to smoke after somebody already else been smoking all night and giving out cigarettes. You know. But some people's reactions have been over the top, beyond the pale, and should be dealt with by being prosecuted by the fullest extent of the law. For instance, Louisville area doctor who choked a black 18 year old woman for not social distancing to his satisfaction. Okay, he could face charges for singling out and physically attacking a young black woman in a dispute over social distancing. The older man was walking with a woman when he encountered a group of younger women over the weekend at the Kentucky City's Norton Commons Amphitheater. And a video of the encounter shows him approaching the group. We are leaving one of the younger women tells the doctor, please let's not cuss each other out. The doctor who is not identified in news reports because he has not yet been charged, points to one woman and calls her an a-hole before shoving her. What the F is your problem, another woman asked him. Don't touch her. The man then shoved one of the white women to the ground and then drops to the ground to choke the only black woman in the group. A second video shows a younger man approach the doctor who lets the young woman go as the group shouts at him. You just assaulted a human being, a child, one of, one of the women said. A police report shows the 18-year-old victim suffered minor injuries when the man choked her and impeded her breathing. 
He could face and should face a felony charge of first degree strangulation. This is, this is the kind of crazy crap that goes on. You know, even in the in the midst of a crisis, your ass still got to be racist. And of course, we got those that want to profit from this. It's from a truck driver's sister in Wyoming. He says she just got off the phone with her brother who stopped in Danville, New York for dinner. The restaurant name is Country Pride, located at the TA truck stop, exit five on Highway 390, so y'all know where the hell this place is. The truck driver was going to order a sandwich and a cup of chili. They are charging $26 for a sandwich and a cup of chili. Their defense was that they can charge what they want as truckers don't have many other options. Sad that these truck stops are trying to make a killing of the truckers that are working around the clock to make deliveries. Spread that around. Let people know what's going on. Now, I was looking for this other story uh, about this company that had been laying people off and one of their workers was laid off. So, of course, he went to collect unemployment. And as is the practice, Department of Labor contacted his employer and let him know. His employer said he's not laid off. He's on a zero hour schedule. Therefore, he does not qualify for unemployment. This is what some of these corporations I come up with so that, you know, they don't have to pay any more into their unemployment insurance. In spite of the unemployment being propped up by the government and what have you, they're still going to try to deny people unemployment. So they're going to leave this man out here broke and how many other employees they have come up with this crap zero hour schedule. How slimy can you be to do something like that? That's beyond slimy. It's just, just you know, shameless, just shameless, just shameless slime. I'm Patrice Gibbs. This is the open eye. The Mission of Delaware Center for Homeless Veterans centers around two main goals housing and support services. DCHD's housing goal is to provide safe, affordable housing coupled with support services. Hey. Homeless veterans and their families who are at risk of homelessness while simultaneously spreading the impact of other community-based organizations. By providing housing first and ending the cycle of homelessness for the veteran and supplying them with supportive services. <laughs> Y'all love Facebook Live. This my man, Little Sorobo, on the line here. <laughs> Cracking up on me on that last line. Hold up, bro. Uh, you got it. I just paid some bills. All right. All right. Okay. Dope and I, 95.3 FM, the education station. Okay. COVID-19, global coronavirus death tolls hits 100,000. 100,000 people have died from this. The death toll hit a new benchmark as uh, Christians prepare for the Easter Sunday weekend. 
I hope you, some of you uh, Christian ministers, take heed and understand that practicing social distance would be in line with your religious beliefs. Okay, the sad milestone, milestone comes as Christians around the globe mark Good Friday in front of computer screens instead of church pews. There are some churches that are adhering, you know, to the social uh, distance order. Public health officials are warning people against violating the social distance rules over Easter and allowing the virus to flare up again. Authorities are using roadblocks and other means to discourage travel. 100,000 across the world. Now, last week, a week ago, last Saturday, I gave you the numbers uh, here in Newcastle County of people that have tested positive for the coronavirus. Just a week ago, 450 people tested positive by last Saturday. This Saturday, 1,326 people, almost 1,000 people here in Delaware since last Saturday, within one week. Practice social distancing, especially considering what we're dealing with. With the orange disaster in charge here, you know, our leadership is sorely lacking. Unfortunately, governors are taking the lead, those that aren't following behind the orange disaster. Now, here's something else that's, that's real crazy, okay? Government officials are being warned not to contradict Trump on untested meds. It's a problem when officials are told to do research they don't support. It's a bigger problem when they're told not to contradict Trump's assumptions. There's no shortage of problems associated with the orange disaster effectively serving as an infomercial pitch man for untested COVID-19 medicinal treatments. Let me say that again. An infomercial pitch man, a shuckster, snake oil salesman. As has been discussed, such presidential advice generates unnecessary confusion. It causes a run on drugs that other patients actually need and rely on. And it can lead some to take dangerous risks through self-medicating. And yet, as recently as, the, as this weekend, Trump took the extraordinary step of publicly, publicly encouraging Americans to take hydroxide, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, that, that's hard to produce, I mean, uh, pronounce, hydroxychloroquine, even if the scientific research doesn't support such a recommendation. Making matters worse, that's not the only guidance that's causing trouble. Political had a report just two weeks ago, noting that some health officials are being pulled away from other potential projects to address the president's ha uh, hunch. It published a related report last, just last night, pointing, pointing in an even more unsettling direction. The nation's top infectious disease expert, Anthony Fauci, has repeatedly warned, warned in public and private that no definitive evidence exists about the drug. Behind the scenes, career health officials have raised even stronger warnings about the risk to some Americans' heart health and other complications, but have, but have been warned not to publicly speak out and potentially contradict Trump. They've been warned not to contradict a snake, a, a snake oil salesman. Damn. 
As for the overreaching question, why in the world is Trump pushing this untested treatment with unnerving vigor? Okay, there's a series of possible, possible explanations in the mix here. Maybe it's corruption. The New York Times reported if hydroxyl, hydroxychloroquine becomes an accepted treatment, several pharmaceutical companies stand to profit, including shareholders and senior executives with connections to the arms disaster himself, who has a small personal financial interest in uh, Sanofi the French drug maker that makes Plaquenil, the name brand version of hydroxychloroquine. And maybe it's desperation. Political reports last night, the rush to focus on unproven drugs also comes after months of lost opportunities to contain the spread of the outbreak. Trying to cover over his, his incompetence. Maybe it's the undue influence of non-scientists Rudy Giuliani, celebrity doctor, Dr. Oz, and Peter Navarro have all reportedly been touting hydroxychloroquine and it's quite likely Trump finds them more credible than actual experts. Damn fool, but I tell you, and y'all follow behind this fool and take that stuff. Now, let me tell you something. I think this, I'm pretty sure this is the same drug that's used to, to treat malaria. And there's already been at least one death and one near death from people who listened to the orange disaster and took this stuff. The, whatever the reason, the orange disaster seemed unlikely to stop the campaign to push this drug. See, he'll kill you for some money. Republicans will do that. Corporate to do that. Oh, yeah, they'll kill you for some money. You better know that. They will offer you for some money. They do not have a problem with that. That's the word. They do not have a problem with that. Now, as this uh, coronavirus takes a toll in different places, I saw New York City is having mass burials in their public cemetery and the city is shortening its deadline for people claiming that the 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 day i think it was a month it's down to um 14 days okay and they're buried in what the what is known as potter's field it's on heart island normally about 25 bodies a week are interred on the island mostly for people whose families can't afford a funeral or go on claim by their relatives. In recent days, though, burial operations have increased from one day a week to five days a week with around 24 burials a day. About 40 caskets were lined up for burial on the island on Thursday, and CBS correspondent David Bagoon reported that new graves are being dug on Heart Island. Okay. So, you know, this, this thing is, you know, really off the hook, man. There's no joke out here. Now, one of the things that you've been hearing about, I'm sure, is what to do about the incarcerated. Okay. Delaware prisons have four new cases and in inmates and officers for a total of 16. Two inmates, a probation officer and a correction officer, have been tested positive for COVID-19. The Department of Correction announced Friday, I'd like to thank the uh, News Journal for this. That raises a total of 16 cases associated with state prisons. There are now four inmates, two probation officers, and 10 correctional officers who have tested positive. The two new inmates who tested positive we're at the uh, James T. Vaughan Correctional Center, better known as Gander Hill. I'm pretty sure that's, that's Gander Hill. They were in the same housing unit in which the first two inmates tested positive last week. Okay, now it's not so bad here. 
because uh, one inmate is being treated at the prison infirmary and is stable. The other was taken to a local hospital for further evaluation and treatment Thursday afternoon. The hospital man, the hospitalized man is stable and not in intensive care. The latest probation and parole officer to test positive for the corona works at Sussex, Sussex uh, Community Correction Center in Georgetown. The officer began in a self-isolated home after experiencing flu-like symptoms. Like I said, not so bad here, okay? Now, some places, it's pretty bad and it's being suggested, and it's being suggested to take place here as well, that nonviolent offenders be either released or sent home uh, under house arrest. And this because it affects everyone involved, obviously, more so right now here in Delaware, the correction officers. Now, in other places, uh, the prisoners aren't being treated so well. David Sell, an inmate who described his, uh, where is David Sell? Let me look through the story right quick. Because, yeah, in New York, state prison in New York. He described his experience in a situation that health experts say is a tinderbox waiting to ignite. Now, there's already been some protest in a few prisons that have been put down because the inmates have felt, the incarcerated have felt unsafe. And this is why. Over the course of a seven-day quarantine for COVID, David Sell, an inmate in Wendy, Correctional facility says he received no medicine, no care, not even a change of clothes. He said he had to plead with prison staff to clean the thermometer before taking his temperature. I asked the doctor, how am I going to be treated? And she, all she said was basically, just ride it out. How you like that? Just ride it out. The hell you gonna ride it out to death? She need to ride it out to hell with gasoline drawers on. So who is serving 40, 43 years to life in prison, 20, 20 miles outside of uh, Buffalo, gave a harrowing account of how the coronavirus is spreading behind bars and how little care is available to prisoners who fall ill. You had one guy spitting up blood and they still was hesitant about taking him to the hospital. The man spitting up blood. Well, well maybe with that now, well, 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 I don't need to go to the hospital. Law students from City University in New York, along with video students, said Bar College first recorded cell last fall to show his plea for clemency. The students caught up with him again last Monday and recorded his experience with COVID-19. Cell, who was convicted of murder 24 years ago, is one of approximately 400 prisoners and correction workers in the state who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, 400 in New York, the state of New York. Former movie producer Harvey Weinstein, convicted of rape, rapist Harvey Weinstein, is also a, a victim of COVID-19. And that's something called Harvey Weinstein, a victim of anything. Sounds like oxymoron. Anyway, prison health experts have repeatedly warned state officials that prisons and jails, like Wendy, could be a tinderbox for the virus to spread. The New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision declined to comment on cells treatment. No kidding. Almost said something else. But said inmates who have tested positive or are showing symptoms of the virus, isolated up to 14 days and provided with standard medical care. Obviously a lie. Inmates with more acute needs are taken to hospitals for treatment. Okay, what's more acute than throwing up blood? If you're someone who is seeing the impact of coronavirus firsthand, we'd like to hear from you. Reach out to us. Um, you know, you're on Facebook or, wait a minute, where is it, where is it? I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. 
if you're on Facebook Live, there's a the number, 302-442-1661. Uh -huh. Cell said he's recovering and expects to be moved back to the main prison early next week. His clemency is still pending. You know, it's um, it's something how people are treated. Yeah, I know Mr. Cell committed a crime or whatever, but he's still human. Shouldn't he be executed? I don't believe in the death penalty because of the racial uh, disparity in it. Okay, should he be punished? Yes. Should he be treated inhumanely? No. You disagree with me on that? The hell with you. I'm Patrice Gibbs. It's dope and I. Excuse me, y'all. You know, sometimes I like to make light of the situation, but right now I really won't. And I will tell you how I have been making light of the coronavirus and what have you. Uh, I got a little scratch in my throat or I got to blow my nose. I, Mona, is that you? You know, this thing is, it is, it is very serious. Very serious. Over the last couple of open eye broadcasts, something that I pointed out was the fact that there has not, up until that point, been any breakdown as far as race is concerned. And that was problematic because I was certain that there was a racial problem, as always is the case, racial disparities, whenever we're dealing with a public problem, especially health care. There's always some racial disparities going on, okay? And that comes from a history of racial disparities. And I guess you could call it uh, cruelty, uh, medical corruption, and you know, some other terms that I will not use on the air, you know, the reason for distrust amongst African Americans with the medical industry, with doctors and what have you, is because of the history that we've had. Okay. The CDC must end its silence on the racial impact of COVID-19. This is from Spencer Over Overton. Spencer Overton is president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies and a professor at George Washington University uh, Law School. Spencer Overton says, the early data suggests that the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting black communities particularly hard. As of Monday, African-Americans made up 27% of the population in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but 70% of its COVID-19 deaths. In Chicago, 30% of the population, but 69% of the deaths. In Louisiana, the disparity is 32% and 70%. 32% of the population, 70% of the deaths. A similar divide can be seen in Michigan, 
where African Americans make up 14% of the population as of Friday and accounted for 40% of COVID-19 deaths. I'm gonna tell you something. There were those that initially here in the US and in Europe who wanted to put a black face on the COVID virus and could not figure out why it was not affecting Africa to the extent that it's affected Europe and America. Right now, America is the um, in the lead as far as number, I don't have the exact number, it's right here in front of me today, but the number of those that have tested positive for COVID-19. Okay. As a matter of fact, I reported last week that some French doctors came up with a vaccine and wanted to test it in Africa, where the numbers are actually low. And you test it in Europe, test it here amongst white people. The hell, go to hell with that. And of course, uh, the African nations are uh, getting coming over here and testing the damn thing. The disproportionate impact appears to be attributable to pre-existing conditions, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and inadequate access to health care that make African Americans more vulnerable to the disease. But the handful of examples above raises an urgent question. Does the effect hold true for African Americans throughout the country? I would think so. It's why we need everyone to do their part to slow the spread. Like I said, continue to practice social distancing. Stay in if you don't have to go out. You're not essential. Unfortunately, there's no way for the public to know. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is not providing nationwide data about COVID-19's impact on African Americans, Latinos, or other racial and ethnic groups. The CDC customarily reports such data, but it has not done so with COVID-19. Many states and counties are, are also not publishing the information. As of Tuesday, the CDC has not responded to inquiries about whether it has the demographic data and isn't releasing it or it simply isn't tracking the information. In this critical moment, the federal government must, must collect and disclose racial data on COVID-19 testing cases and deaths. States and local governments should do the same. This demographic data could help save lives. Understanding which populations are most vulnerable allows public health officials to partner with messengers who can speak credibly to specific communities offering up-to-date information about social distancing, sheltering in place, and other preventive measures. Okay. And Dr. Fossey says, the coronavirus is shining a bright light on unacceptable health disparity, disparities for African Americans. All right. Dr. Fossey struck an emotional tone on Tuesday's White House coronavirus press briefing when discussing the disproportionate COVID-19 death toll facing African Americans in some places. And the reason I want to bring it up, because I couldn't help sitting there reflecting on how sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis like we are now with the coronavirus, it really does have ultimately shine a very bright light on some of the real weaknesses and foibles in our society, Fossey said. Fossey said death rates and intensive care intubations were higher among African Americans because of greater prevalence of underlying medical conditions, diabetes, I'm diabetic, hypertension, obesity, and asthma. You know, I'm, I'm going to get to another factor that no one really wants to seem to talk about. Now, statistics show that African Americans typically, typically have poorer health and outcomes and experience racism in healthcare 
in overwhelming numbers. Now with COVID-19, it seems that African-Americans disproportionately make up the number of deaths to disease. Why is this? Could it be attributed to us not receiving the same treatment as whites? One of my Facebook friends has been a long time friend who is in the healthcare industry related this to me. Definitely, definitely not getting tested because they don't meet all the requirements. Just being sent home with meds. He's talking about what's happening to black people in, in, in these hospitals and places where they're supposed to be tested. They're not being tested being sent home and told to stay in for 14 days. We had one guy come in three times, got sent home every time. Kept refusing to test him, kept refusing to test him. Then started coughing up, then he started coughing up fluid and finally was tested and then ended up in ICU for a week. Positive for the virus but literally had to be on his deathbed to be tested. I'll tell you something, when you talk about the high rate of COVID-19 deaths in the black community, do not mention diabetes, high blood pressure and asthma without also mentioning the poverty, redlining, gentrification, food deserts, healthcare disparities, environmental and systematic institutional racism that leads to those underlying conditions. American medicine was built on the backs of slaves and it still affects how doctors treat patients to this very day. Don't mention it without bringing up the poverty, redlining, gentrification, food deserts, healthcare disparities, environmental and systematic institutional racism that led to those underlying causes. Don't do it. I'm Patrice Gibbs. This is The Open Eye. Yes, I am passionate about that. I mean it with my heart. No one likes a warrior until the enemy is at the gate. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are, aren't gonna like what I have to say, but anybody knows me, no, I don't give a damn. All right, I'll tell you something. I'm a writer, that's what I do, primarily. The reactions I get when I tell people that I'm a writer, and published author are very interesting. The reactions range from smirks and frowns to got to have your books. One response that really gets me is, I was going to write a book. That usually comes with a smirk. Really? Well, you didn't. Another is, oh, you need to write my life story. Okay. What happened in your life that people want to read about it? When the man is keeping me down and won't let me get a job. Okay, instead of a book, let's write a pamphlet and call it how purple weed and your breasts hanging out have kept you from being unemployed. Needless to say, these types never buy a book. Then there are the educated ones who can't believe or wrap their heads around the fact that I am a writer. They can't believe I could have anything valid to say. They asked me 35 questions about the book. Well, hell, do you want me to read the book to you? These are smirkers too. 
they never purchase books either, unless they get a discount. Mm -hmm. The words didn't magically appear on the pages. I had to put in work. And like anybody else, I expected to be paid for my work. There are, then there are the sawyers of the lot, the ones you can hide secrets from in a book. I do on occasion give away a free book. These people won't even read it for free. Just sad. Last but not least are my favorites. These are the ones that buy the book with enthusiasm, want to sign, and walk away as if I gave them a golden gift displaying all the eagerness to read my words. To those people, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude. Thanks for the support. Read a book. It's not illegal yet. Open your mind. Increase your vocabulary and capacity to think. One of my books will lead you there. I'm a damn good writer, if I must say so myself. I'm Patrice Gibbs. This is The Open Eye. And like I always tell you, destiny determines who enters your life. But you decide who stays. Therefore, value those who value you. And don't treat those as a priority who treat you as an option. I'm Patrice Gibbs. This is the Open Eye on WHGE 95.3 FM. Thanks for joining me. All right, all right. Facebook Live friends, thanks for joining me. Hey, hey, Alan, I see you over there. So I didn't get that information out about uh, the doctor from Kentucky. Uh, that's where it is. And Ms. Perez, thank you for being in there. All right. And I will see you next week. Listen, I post the um, Facebook Live broadcast on YouTube. Like, share, and describe. All right. All right. See you all next week.